Friends, I want to remind you here that today is Communion Sunday, and on this day is at our practice to keep our kids in here the entire day with us during worship to remind us as the adults that the body of Christ includes children. It is for people of all ages and also for our children to be a part of our worship service here today. Normally we have a Kids Way program, but on Communion Sundays, our kids are with us. As we jump into the Word of God here this morning, I want to encourage you to pull out your GPS, our guide for prayer and study. This is a tool we use each week during worship and throughout the weekday to stay engaged together as a church family through the word of God and prayer. On the front, you're going to find information about today's message and our new series and a place to take notes. And on the back, you're going to find scripture readings and prayers for each day from the Old and New Testament, all relating back to today's message so we can continue to listen for how God is speaking to us as we go throughout our week. Well, we are starting a brand new series here for the month of July where we're going to look at the foundations of our faith. What do we ground our faith upon? Where do we get our information about God? How do we come to believe what we believe about God? What do we know about what it means to be a Christian? And where does that come from? And so we're going to look at that here together. And so we're going to focus our whole series around this theme scripture, this invitation that Christ offers, a common invitation that he gave to people when he would encounter them. So it's our tradition to read our theme scriptures together as a church family. So will you join with me in our theme verse from John 1? When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. This is an invitation that Jesus commonly offers. Come and see. Come and follow me. Come and walk alongside me. And people do and their lives are dramatically changed. But we don't have that same access to Jesus Christ as a human being walking around. We don't get to literally come and follow Jesus Christ, the human being. For us, it's spiritual. We have the Holy Spirit present with us. That invitation for us is not quite as easy. So how do we come and see? If we can't literally walk with the man Jesus Christ around Galilee, how do we come and learn about God? Where do we get our beliefs from? How do we build our faith? What are our foundations? We're going to talk about that over the next month. Where do we get our information from? In the United Methodist Church, we call these sources the quadrilateral. It's a fancy word to talk about the four ways we understand who God is. There are four different sources we draw from, experience, scripture, tradition, and reason. We talk about being a thinking church. It's one of the things I love so much about our denomination. Throughout history, there have been a lot of religions that demanded blind obedience. Don't question, just follow. And it become very easy to get off track in places like that, to just follow the teachings of one person. And I've always been very skeptical of places that don't let you ask questions, that just say believe and trust blindly. And the Methodist Church has never been that way. From the very beginning, we've wanted to have open eyes. Bring your mind to bear. What do you think about this? Does this make sense? Let's have a conversation about it. It's why we say that every week in our creed, that we question and examine the nature of God so we might learn to tell Christ's story of hope. We're a thinking church, and I love that so much. We talk about the traditions of our church. In the Methodist church, we love traditions. We talk about honoring the work of those who have come before us, that great cloud of witnesses. People have been following God for thousands of years, and so we learn from those who have come before us. We look to the traditions of the church to help teach us about God. And we hold Scripture to be primary. Scripture, the Holy Bible, is our primary source of information. It's not the only source, but it is primary. It's the most important. So we talk about it being primary, but what we say is experience is first. And that's why we're going to talk about experience here today. Because nobody comes without life experience. We are all a product of the things we've gone through. When we read the Bible, we read it as the person who's gone through, who comes from where we come from, who reads in the language we read. Everybody has life experience that we bring to bear when we come to God, when we come to church. When you walk into any circumstance... You are bringing all your experiences, all your expectations, all your assumptions, everything from your past life. So we can't escape our experience. It's the first thing that helps us learn who God is, is our experience. So it's not the most important source, that's scripture, but it's first. 
It's the first way we encounter God. And so we're going to talk about that here today. And to help us, we're going to look at a story when Jesus had an experience with someone. All throughout the Gospels, we see people running into Jesus and encountering him in different ways. And the story we're going to look at today is very famous. It's a woman from Samaria who meets Jesus at a well. We call this the woman at the well or the Samaritan woman at the well. And this is an incredible moment where she encounters Jesus And everything changes in her life. This is a really long story, so we're just going to read a little part of it, and then we'll talk through a lot of it later. But Tiffany's going to come read for us a piece of that story of the woman at the well. Seven through ten. Oh, there I am. Okay. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy, gracious, and amazing God, we thank you for the moments in our lives where we have experienced your presence. It's the first way we come to know about you. God, we all have life experiences that determine who we are and what we believe, for better and for worse. God, our experience with you in the world It's profound in determining what we believe about who we're supposed to be and who you are. So teach us here today what happened when this Samaritan woman encountered you at the well and what happens to our lives when we experience you and how that determines the way we are to live. God, speak to us here in this place and we will listen for we are your people and this is your house. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this week, Netflix released season three of one of my all-time favorite shows called Stranger Things. We have any Stranger Things fans? Okay, excellent. Okay, there's a little more in this service than the last service, so more of you have seen the light. If you have not seen Stranger Things, you should. It is one of my absolute favorite shows. It is incredible. It's a sci-fi series set in the 80s in Hawkins, Indiana, this little sleepy town where nothing ever happens. That's how they describe it, this little town where nothing ever happens in Indiana, and these four kids begin to encounter some strange things. And as the series goes on, stranger and stranger things happen. They encounter monsters and government conspiracies and all kinds of wild, crazy silliness. And it's wonderful. And I love it so much. And in this show, there's three seasons. And it's a streaming series on Netflix. And so they don't release it like one week at a time. They just dump the whole season on Netflix all at once. And so I am proud slash embarrassed to say that I watched the entire third, se- uh, third season in one day. Nancy's with me. Praise God. All right. Watch the whole season. Okay, except for like the second half of the finale. I fell asleep, so I had to finish it the next day. But I binge watched the whole thing. I just love this show. And the show's about these kids who encounter these monsters and these weird, strange things. And one of the things that runs common throughout the entire series, I'm not going to spoil anything if you guys are worried about that. You can just like rest easy, okay? I'm not that person. I hate people like that. It's not me. But in this whole series, there's this running issue that the characters have to wrestle with, which is they're not believed. Whether it's a kid or an adult, whoever it is, when they encounter one of these strange, supernatural, weird things, when they tell somebody about it, people don't believe them. And we often do that. We dismiss people when they talk about something supernatural or crazy, or especially when children will say something fantastical, we're quick to dismiss, right? Because we as adults are skeptical. The older we get, the more skeptical we get of things. Oh, I'm sure it was a coincidence. Oh, I'm sure it was just a shadow or a dream, or you were just anxious because it was dark, and so we kind of brush it off. But all throughout the series, there's this running trope of having to justify that these things are real, that they're really happening. And one of the things I've noticed in the show is that the more a character encounters these strange things, the more experiences they have with this, these monsters, this other dimension, this weird stuff that's happening the more they begin to understand how that world works, the more they begin to understand the forces at play, the more they see and experience these strange things, the more they come to understand how it all works. And the more I thought about this, I thought, you know, this 
as weird as it sounds, like this is how it is with God. This is how people are with God. The more times you experience God, you start to experience God a little more. And the more supernatural or holy something that happens to you, the less likely it is that someone will believe you. We've all heard stories, maybe you've experienced them personally, where you heard God's voice, you saw an angel, someone who was sick and dying miraculously got better, and the doctors can't explain it. And we often use words like coincidence, or I don't know. The more supernatural, the more holy, the more skeptical we are. But we know from experience that the more we encounter God, the more we have those real experiences, the better we understand how things work, the closer we draw to God. Experience is so profound in shaping what we believe about the world, what we believe about God. Our experiences define that. We always treasure eyewitness accounts, right? People will say that. Well, what happened? Well, you've heard a lot of things, but I was there. So let me tell you what happened. And everybody's quiet, and they listen to that person because they were there. They experienced it. That experience carries so much weight in our life. And it's very true when we look at God as well. And so I wanted to look at this story when Jesus encounters this woman at the well and how that encounter sort of changes her whole life and opens her up in a way that's very unexpected when you start to learn more about what's really going on in this story. So I want to look through this again. If you brought your Bible with you, we are in John chapter 4. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. So here at the very beginning, we know something about her. And for those of us here today, that word Samaritan doesn't really mean much to us. Or we may think, oh, it's like a, this is like a good neighbor, like a charitable person, like a good Samaritan. We think of that phrase as it's used in the modern vernacular, but that comes from Scripture. It's a parable Christ told, the parable of the good Samaritan. And today, a Samaritan means just a nice person. But at the time, a Samaritan was someone from Samaria. It was their ethnic and national identity. Just like we would say someone who's from Canada is Canadian. That's what a Samaritan is. They are someone from Samaria. And the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. There was a long history of animosity between these two groups. And so where Jesus is from, up by the Sea of Galilee, is separated from Jerusalem, where his ministry and his life ends, by Samaria. And people, the Jewish people would go all the way around Samaria. They wouldn't take a direct route through it. And remember, they're walking everywhere, right? It's not like I'm going to choose to take 75 so I don't have to pay the toll on the Dallas North Tollway, right? Like, that's not that sort of detour, okay? They're like walking to Oklahoma City and they're going to go by route of Arkansas. Like, we would never do that. But that's how much animosity there was between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. So we may skate right over that. It's a Samaritan woman, but that's in there on purpose. This sets the scene, and the people at the time would have instantly known these two people are not friends. These two people, a Jewish rabbi and a Samaritan woman, women at the time had no standing politically. And a Jewish rabbi was a man of authority. And so you have two very unequal people who are not friends, in fact, their people are enemies, meeting here at the well. That's what's going on in this story to kind of set the context for us. Her experience as a Samaritan is going to shape everything that's going to happen next, all of her assumptions, everything about what she sees about Jesus, what she believes about Jesus, what she believes about this man is all colored by the fact that she is from Samaria and he is a Jewish rabbi. They are enemies. Jesus meets this woman and says, will you give me a drink of water? He's there by himself. His disciples went to get food. And the Samaritan woman said, how is it that you, a Jewish person, ask a drink of water from me, a woman of Samaria? We don't share anything in common. Why would you ask me for this? So you see her name, the cultural difference. She sort of names the elephant in the room. Why are you talking to me? Do you know who I am? We don't share anything in common. Why are you speaking to me? And Jesus, at this moment, begins to give her a hint into the fact that the conversation that's about to follow is not going to be one that she's ever experienced, and it's not about water. She thinks they're just talking about water. And Jesus says very quickly, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't just ask me for water. You wouldn't ask me these questions or who I am. You'd ask me for living water, this thing that will sustain you for the rest of your life, and I'd give it to you. And she's confused. She says, I don't, what is living water? I don't understand. Is there something living in the water that's called a fish? I don't need a fish. What are you talking about? What's living water? 
And so she's confused, and Jesus is kind of setting the stage that this conversation will be different. And in verse 16, everything changes. Everything changes. Remember, these two people do not know each other. Jesus says to the woman, go and call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. So what you have said is true. Now imagine you're the woman in this situation. You don't know this man. And he says, hey, go and get your husband, which wouldn't have been uncommon at the time. Women were egregiously just seen as property at the time. So go and get your husband would have been an understandable request, but she doesn't have one. Not only does she not have one, she's had five husbands. Five husbands. Divorce was a sin. You had to be married at the time. Women had no standing without it. And so not only is she a woman from Samaria who's at odds with Jesus, who's a Jewish rabbi, she's a woman who's single and has had five husbands. She is not a good person societally. She is in very bad standing. And Jesus points out that he knows this about her. Think about what's going through her mind. When we think about encountering Jesus, we think of how incredible it would be. We're filled with hope. But this is a threat. This is a man who has immense power over her, who is her enemy, who now knows this incredible, damning information about her, knows her darkest secrets, and has pointed that out to her. She's not calm. And she's also wondering, who is this guy? How does he know this about me? There's no reason that Jesus would know this. There's no reason Jesus would know this information about her. And here in this moment, she realizes that Jesus is something different. Jesus is, this is a different person. He shouldn't know this information. He's not judging me or condemning me. He's just sort of establishing that he knows this about me. Who is this person? And she realizes he's different. Something about this is not right. And so she says to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Prophets spoke for God. They knew things. And so she makes this assumption. You seem to know things. You must be a prophet. So she asks him this question. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Our Samaritan ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you, the Jewish people, say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. So she asks him a question that, makes, that sort of points out the difference in their cultures. But if you think about this for a second, this is not the sort of casual conversation you ask somebody while you're drawing water at the well, right? Imagine you're standing at the checkout line at Kroger and you're talking to somebody. You wouldn't be like, oh, I see that you were a Jewish person. Your ancestors said that you should worship over here, but me as a Christian, you would never say that to somebody at the candy aisle at Kroger. This is not a casual conversation. She's had this question in her mind for a long time. You don't just say that off the top of your head. She's had this question in her mind for a long time. And this experience with Christ has sort of melted her defenses, taken those walls down, and she's asking a question that sort of questions all of her past experience, everything she knows. She's not asking this because there was disagreement about where the Samaritans should worship. She understands that this guy's different. He knows something about God. And so I'm going to ask this question that sort of calls everything I know into question. The hour is coming, Jesus responds, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So he says, pretty soon, the answer to your question is going to be, it doesn't matter. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, he knows that the Jewish people have it right, that they worship the right God, because that's him, right? Like, he is God. So he's cheating in this instance. He knows the answer. The Jews got it right, because it's me. Um, you don't have it all right yet, but pretty soon it won't matter. That's what he's saying. There are differences in our culture, but pretty soon it's not going to matter. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And so he's essentially saying to her, there are differences in our culture. And so I can answer your question historically, but it doesn't matter because I'm about to do something that's going to change everything. And these differences won't matter. Scripture will later describe this in Paul's famous words. There's no longer slave or free, Jew or Greek, male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. These divisions that have divided forever are no longer going to be relevant because we will all be one in Jesus Christ. Jesus is foreshadowing what his death and resurrection is going to do for everyone. 
He's telling this woman, you have no idea who you're talking to. Your question is valid, but it's not going to matter soon because I'm about to change everything. And God reveals something that she didn't know before. Now, this is a microcosm of what happens when we experience God. This happens in the matter of probably five minutes while he's talking to this woman at the well, and her life is totally changed. She leaves from that place proclaiming that Christ is God, and everything about her life has changed. And for us, it takes a little more time because we don't have the physical human being Jesus to encounter. But this is what experience with God does for us. It changes everything. It sees us for who we are, even if who we are is someone who has five divorces and is ashamed of our social standing, but doesn't judge us. Someone who answers our questions, but reminds us that God's ways are so much more than our ways and changes everything about our world when we experience God. An experience with God changes everything. And one of the things that we're called to do is share those experiences with one another. She's a Samaritan woman. No standing, an enemy to the Jewish people with five divorces. Her experience is going to be unique and fundamentally different from a lot of people she would encounter as she follows Christ. Even the disciples, they're all men. None of them have five divorces. None of them are Samaritans. So the way they see God is going to be very different from hers. And that's the beauty of the church is we share our experiences together so we see God in a more complete way. That's the whole point of gathering together in community. And I love when this is experienced. And the best time that I ever experienced this was one of the first churches I worked in. I just graduated from college, and I was working in this little church. And in the middle of the week, they had this chapel service. And in that service, there was a woman who was 102 years old. And I sat down next to her. I was 22 at the time. Sat down next to her, and I said, oh, my gosh, tell me about everything. You're 100. You've lived over a century. What is life even like for you? How are you still alive? Like 102 years. What have you seen? What's been the craziest thing you've ever seen? Was it like, was it World War II? Like, what was it? Was it World War I? When was World War I? I'm like trying to do math, like remember history class. What have you seen in life? What's been the craziest thing you've ever experienced? And she kind of sat there and she thought and she said, well, you know, when that car came to our town, I, I, that, was, that was a really big one. I'm thinking that car, what car? It's like, like, a, like the first sports car or like what, what kind of car? What car came to town to change everything for you? That's not what I was expecting said, no, the car. Oh, like as opposed to the horse. She said, yeah, the car. This guy rolled in on this car. and We were like, well, that'll never last. That's a dumb fad. Who would want that over a horse? And I thought, that is not what I was expecting you to say. (laughs) You are far older than I had imagined. (laughs) I thought you were going to be like the internet. But no, it's the car. It was wild. And let me tell you, the difference between the way a 22-year-old sees God and the way a 102-year-old person sees God, unbelievably different. Because at 22, I had all the answers. I knew everything. Every 22-year-old knows everything. Don't you know that? I had all the answers. I had all the positions I was supposed to have. I knew all the answers. I had everything figured out. So I'd ask her, you know, tell me about God. Like, what have you learned about God? And she said, you know what I've learned about God in a century? And I said, what? She said, I don't really know anything about God. It's like, come on, lady. I know everything about God, so let me tell you. And I've noticed that's true. People who really have wisdom, the longer they live, the more wisdom they gain, the more they realize they don't know anything how huge the universe is, how big God is, and how insignificant my opinion is. We all love our opinion. We think when we speak, everyone should shut up and listen because we figured it out. Well, actually, let me tell you the truth, and we love to speak without authority. But I've listened. The wiser the person I've met, the less authority they claim to have because they've experienced God enough to know better. They've had those life experiences. And when we shared together, I learned more about God from that 102-year-old lady than I had in 22 years of life because she had a century's worth of experience to share with me. That's what happens when we share our experiences with each other. We see God wider and deeper. But it's easy for us in our world to make our experience prescriptive for everyone. This is how I've experienced God, so this is the only way to experience God. This is how I've heard about this topic, so it's the only way to believe about it. This is how I read this scripture, so it's the way everyone has to read this scripture. 
And it's one of the struggles, and it's why I love that we have four sources and not just one, because it's easy to start to believe that we have all the answers. It's easy for us to think, well, I was there and I know what I believe. And that's why we have to share our experiences together. Every time in Scripture when someone has their life changed, they do something incredible, it follows an encounter with God. People experience God and their life goes in a completely different direction. Even if they were previously murdering Christians for a living like Saul, they go on to write almost the entire New Testament as Paul. God completely changes everything about our life when we encounter and experience God. Those experiences are profoundly impactful. It's the first way we encounter God. And they change us in ways we can't even begin to express. But the struggle is that we often avoid or don't make time for experiences with God. We often avoid or don't make time for experiences with God. And I think there's two main reasons why we do this. The first is that I think we avoid spiritual or emotional places where God is often found because we have pain or fear. Because to acknowledge the grace and forgiveness of God, that God forgives me for what I've done, means I have to confront what I've done. And I've pushed that down. I've buried it. I've moved on. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to dig that up. I don't want to think about these things I've done. Even when you're talking about forgiveness and grace and love, it hits, it hits at that thing we don't want to talk about, that insecurity, that fear we have. We don't want to bring that up, and so we're afraid. We're afraid to go to that spiritual, that emotional place because there's pain there. And to get to the healing, we have to go through the pain, and most of us don't want to. And so we avoid places that are spiritual or emotional or make us deal with those things we've experienced in life. We push away from that. Or we've been conditioned to avoid such things. If you grew up in a culture, in a setting, maybe with parents or coaches or whatever it was, who often told you, be tough, don't cry. Don't show your emotions. Grin and take it. I played high school football in Texas, so I got a lot of that. So I was conditioned. Don't cry. Don't show your emotions. Move on. Tough it out. And so some of us have been taught to avoid those moments where God is often found in our vulnerability, in our honesty. A lot of times we're taught to avoid it. But the main reason, I think, is because we're too busy for God, or at least we think we're too busy. And I know this is true because when I talk to you guys every Sunday morning, which should be the most relaxed you've ever been in the week, right? Like if there's going to be a day where you're the most relaxed, it should be Sunday morning. You've just come off a whole day of no work, no school, and you've got a whole day ahead of you. It should be the most relaxed, right? You can't get anxious yet about Monday because you've got a whole day before you get there, and you've got a whole day of rest from your week. But the number one thing that I hear from almost everybody I talk to every Sunday morning, hey, how's it going this morning? I'm just tired, man. Things are busy. They're crazy. It's never bad, right? No, everything's great in my life. It's wonderful. I'm blessed. Everything. The Lord is good. Amen. I'm just busy. And we're so tired. Because from the moment our alarm goes off, or if you're like me, like after the third snooze, you're running. You got that calendar. You got all the things you got to do. You got to check all the boxes. You got to race until you crash asleep at the end of the day. And we're so busy, we even have to like make an agenda and a schedule for our rest. We're like, okay, if I can just make it to our vacation, then I'll rest. But our vacation's in like October, right? So it's like, if I don't stop for air until October, I'll be great. But then what do we do on our vacation? We got to see the museums. We got to take the kids to the water park. We got to run and run and run. And we come back. And the number one thing I hear from people when they come back from vacation, I just need some time off. Like you just took a vacation. Oh, we were just so busy the whole time. Well, then you did it wrong. (laughs) You did it wrong. And we're running. We're so busy. And when things get hard, we work harder. I saw a really powerful article this week that's really stuck with me, and I want to share it with you. I just want to read part of it. This is about something that a Methodist bishop recently said to her conference. You want me to answer my emails, Bishop Elaine Stanofsky read aloud at the end of Oregon-Idaho's annual conference a couple weeks ago. The participants had previously had the opportunity to leave her notes with questions or concerns, and so there was a smattering of laughter as she responded. And I want you to know, said the bishop, that when I opened my email this morning, I had 89 new messages since last night. I want to answer your emails, and I want to answer the physical mail you send me. And I know that every week, 
things fall through the cracks. And I know that the solution to our dilemma is not going to be that the bishop works harder. That's a confession, she said. I give you my heart. I give you way more of my life than I should. And honestly, I don't think we have a model that works for bishops with four states and 440 churches to manage. I'm doing my best, but I'm not going to stop disappointing you. Some thought this was just a mundane exchange in the middle of a speech, but it was far more than that. She said, the answer is not for me to work harder. This is a shift in culture in one sentence. This is a sacred resistance. This is a refusal to let a broken and ineffective system call the shots. And this is holy. The answer is not for me to work harder. What happens if an exhausted parent whispers this? A burned out executive, a stressed out student. When something is broken or overwhelming or the work is piling up, our first inclination is often to double down. We roll up our sleeves, we summon a new wave of focused grit so we can power through the obstacle in front of us. And sometimes that's the best answer, but more often it's not. How did we get here? Is this working for us? What if we've been invited to bring the entire unsustainable culture to a screeching halt? You can do that, by the way. The answer is not for me to work harder. These words have haunted me all week. The answer is not for me to work harder. Because I'm the worst at this. I'm the most guilty. I'm just preaching to myself, and maybe somebody else needs to hear this too. Because when things start to pile up, when things get overwhelming for me, I wake up earlier, I work harder, I roll up my sleeves, and I muscle through it. Because that's what I've been taught to do. That's what I've been taught to do. And I know a lot of people in this room are busy and tired. The answer is not to work harder. Friends, I know a painful amount of people in my life who have stopped going to church because their life got so busy and hectic and overwhelming, something had to give. They were too busy. There was too much going on. They just couldn't keep up. So something had to give. Can't be work. Can't be kids' school. Can't be their activities. They've got to hit all these benchmarks for extracurriculars. Can't be the travel we've got planned. It can't be the time with our family. It can't be the work we've got to do on our house. So it's church. The place that's supposed to breathe life and energy and give a community and a family of hope the source of all life and love in God. And sometimes we let it go because it feels optional in a world of requirements. And I've seen so many people walk away from God because they were too busy. We've had some painful examples of this at our church. A year ago, we planned an adult mission trip to go help the victims of Hurricane Harvey in Houston. We didn't have anybody in our church sign up. And I know that's not because we don't care about people. I know that's not because we don't care about hurricane victims right here in our own state. I know the passion and the heartbeat was there. I heard from almost everybody, I'd really love to go. I can't because I'm too busy. That same summer a year ago, both of our youth mission trips almost had to be canceled. Not because the youth didn't raise the money, not because they didn't have things planned out, because we needed adults to go with them for legal liability insurance reasons. And not a single adult in our church was willing to take that time to go. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I was one of those adults too. Oh, I've got a toddler. I can't go. I'm busy. I'm running a church. I'm too busy. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But it is so easy in our world to be too busy to have an experience with God. It's so easy to pull away. But friends, nothing will bring you closer than an experience with the divine. But we have to put ourselves in those places We have to make those sacrifices. If you're waiting for a time when you're not as busy and you've got some time to spend with God, you're going to be waiting until you die because that doesn't exist. I talk to people and they'll look at their calendar and they'll be like, do you know I don't have a free weekend until December? It's July. And you might think that's crazy, but some of you are in that boat. There's no easy time. We have to make time for God to have these experiences. And when life gets overwhelming, the answer is not to work harder. So I want you to hear that word of grace today, if that's you. If you're feeling overwhelmed and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get through it, your inclination is probably to work harder, to grin, to bear down and get through it. And friends, that's not the answer. When you feel overwhelmed and stressed, the answer is not to work harder. It's to go to God, to come to the God who's the source of all life and peace. Jesus tells this to the woman at the well in our scripture. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who you are talking to, 
You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. God offers us living water, peace and hope, new life that sustains us, a community that loves us and supports us. But we have to make space to have those experiences with God. We have to interrupt our busy lives, go to the well and drink. That living water sustains us forever. And friends, I pray this week that we'll take a look at our schedules and make some time to have an experience with God. Let's pray. Holy, gracious, and amazing God, we thank you for the times in our lives where you've shown up. Our experience with the divine changes everything, just like it did for this Samaritan woman. But God, we are often too busy or too afraid to meet you in those places. We don't want to talk about our feelings, and we're just busy. We've got too much going on. We're tired. We finally got a day off, and we just want to stay home and do nothing. God, we start to believe the lie that sitting around doing nothing is what recharges our soul. But we know that's not true. Inaction is not the same as peace. God, our soul needs to experience your love and presence. We need those experiences in our life because they teach us so much about who, the, who you are. They sustain us and build us up. So God, help us to remember that this matters so deeply. Help us to make space for you in our life to experience you in a powerful way, whatever that looks like for us. Time out of our daily schedule, time in our week, taking a trip each year, doing something, oh God, that's more than just getting through the daily grind. God, we need to experience your love. But to do that, we have to make space for it. So may we be a people who value experiences with you and seek them out. Lord, be with us and help us. We need your presence, and we need your love. Hear our prayers, O oh God, especially the prayer that we raise to you together as a church family, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.